Okay, so now we begin lecture number eight of the fourth week of this course, NE402, Intermediate Nuclear Engineering, uh, focusing on neutron uh, diffusion, neutron transport, uh, radiation transport, as well as Monte Carlo simulation. Now, uh, this is the course content. Uh, when I complete the recordings, I'm going to uh, put up a file before you of the roadmap of this course. Uh, this uh, lecture is on neutron diffusion. It's the third lecture in the series of neutron diffusion. And uh, in the course content, we are over here. We've done uh, the first seven lectures on introduction to nuclear engineering. We've covered a lot of uh, uh, material and then we started neutron diffusion. Okay, so today I'm going to take you through uh, two group neutron diffusion. And uh, uh, before that, I'll say that this is my name and my telephone number is plus nine two three four five five double one five nine three six. Email z a f a r k o r e s h i at yahoo.com. And official email is this one. And my personal website is www.nuclearenge.com. Uh, you're welcome to send me any uh, questions and I would particularly be interested in the feedback. Uh, you find it easy, hard, uh, because the, ma the main purpose of these lectures is to uh, make you understand, to get the concepts and to apply the concepts in the later part of this course on the design of nuclear systems. The uh, computational effort uh, and the simulation and uh, focusing on the parameters, the design parameters. So I'm now going to begin two group neutron diffusion. And I thought I'd start with non-multiplying systems first because there's no fission over here and there's simple uh, second order ordinary differential equations. In this case, they'll be coupled because uh, you'll see that in the one and two group uh, model, they can be downscattering from the higher group to the lower group. What is our objective? It is to find the fast neutron flux as well as the uh, group two neutron flux. So we are out to get uh, two neutron fluxes. Now let me show you the problem. Uh, let me show you the figure first because, and I've gone through this in great detail. I've done this in my hand because uh, my, what I've learned is that, uh, that uh, while you're teaching a course, you assume uh, many things which uh, your student may not actually be following. So these are handwritten notes. I'm going to take you through one derivation uh, step by step, because I feel that if you understand this one derivation step by step, then we can do all others. So this is going to be a little bit slow, this lecture, but I'm step by step so that there's nothing missing in between. So I'm going to focus on, on the mathematics in this lecture. And uh, conceptually, this is what we're going to do. That look at a volume element. So a volume element in a sphere would be four pi r squared dr. But I've just drawn for simplicity, the two boundaries of a shell at r and r plus delta r. Of course, the area would be uh, would be the surface area of a sphere, but I'm, I'm not showing that to you right now. I'm just pretending that there are two walls <clears throat> because I just want to show you the structure of the two group equations. So let's say that through this wall, you get the thermal flux, you get the thermal current J2 and you multiply it by the perpendicular area. So this is an in term. The other in term in this case is it's not crossing any boundary, it is within the volume. And this is what we spoke of in the previous lectures of collision density. So these reactions were taking place in group one, which is higher than group two. So it's a higher energy and collisions were taking place at some higher energy. And as a result of scattering, they came down to this lower energy. All the lower energies are lumped into a single group called group two. So if you look at this diagram, there are two in terms. There is the, uh, the current, which is coming from the boundary. 
and there is the collision density slowing down from higher energies to lower energy. So these two are the inward terms. And let's look at what's leaving us. Well, what's leaving us that once the neutrons become group two neutrons, then they can be captured, they can be removed. And the removal rate is sigma two pi two multiplied by the volume. So that's one term by which they're, they're, they're losing, they're, they're leaving us. We're losing them. The other is the physical crossing of the boundary, the other out term. So if you look at the continuity, if you just count the number of neutrons coming and the number of neutrons going, as I mentioned in the previous lecture, then this is called the conservation of matter, the continuity equation. In the continuity equation, the in terms are these, that there's a J2 at X. I'm, I'm using X but, uh, specifically just to uh, make it simple. I'm going to use R later. So J2 crossing the X boundary multiplied by the perpendicular area plus the scattering from higher to lower energies. So these are the two in terms and these are the two out terms. If I put them equal in a steady state picture, then this is the equation. Now this is the boundary at X plus delta X. So there is a little bit of change between here and here. Now that little bit of change or a perturbation I can, uh, I can express in terms of the Taylor series as what was happening on the left boundary plus the little change that happened inside uh, while coming to the right boundary. So if I do this, then in Taylor series, this function at X plus delta X becomes this function at X plus uh, D by DX of the function multiplied by, you can see a little delta X in the bracket also and all that multiplied by the same perpendicular surface. Now that results in these two terms canceling out. And again, I get an equation which has two variables, flux and uh, current. And you can see it's a coupled equation because actually I'm trying to write an equation for group two, but this has come in from group one. So this is where the coupling uh, takes place in the model that I'm going to discuss in this lecture. So uh, if you see that, uh, of course, we cannot solve it until you use uh, fixed law. So fixed law says that J is minus D grad phi. So J2 is minus D2 D by DX phi 2. Now if I do that, I can write the diffusion equation. And the purpose of this whole thing was to show you that the source term in the second group is actually the downscattering term from the first group. Okay, so I hope this is clear because this is the structure of this equation. Now, once this becomes clear to you, then these two equations should become clear also. That in the first equation, there's no source, as you can see, it's a, it's a homogeneous equation. There's no source, there's no independent source. Well, actually, if there's no source and there's no multiplication, then where are the neutrons coming from? So we have to have a source and I'm going to introduce it through the boundary, uh, through the left boundary. So it will come in through the boundary conditions. Well, for group one, you can see that we have a leakage term and we have a removal term because these neutrons, there's no group higher than group one. And there's only one group lower than group one and that is group two. So these neutrons, so this is the diffusion coefficient D1. This is the removal cross-section macroscopic in group one. And these are all coming down. There's no source term in group one equation. Now in the group two equation, as I mentioned, this is, sorry, this is supposed to be a minus sign, as I showed over here, that D del square phi minus sig two plus S2. So if I take the plus S2 to the right hand side, so it becomes a negative sign. Okay, so, so you can see that this one I can solve directly, but this one I can solve on the left hand side if I remove this and then I need to put the solution of this equation over here and I again need to solve for the right hand side. So this is what we mean by coupled equations. So the two group model now, these two equations that you can see, 326 and 327, are the two group diffusion equations for a non-multiplying medium. And 
the way they're written over here, the properties, meaning D and sigmas, are functions of position. And I'm going to remove that. I'm going to simplify that further. And I'm going to say that the material has uniform properties. In other words, the macroscopic cross-sections are constant. So I'm going to take them out. Now, finite and infinite medium. Let me start by finite, and then I'm going to reduce it to the infinite as a special case. Okay, so then I, I think it will be better conceptually. Okay, so we have a candle in the center of a sphere, a candle meaning a point isotropic source. And in spherical coordinates, uh, for a point P on a sphere, uh, and the radius R, the point P is at a radius R. And to define the point P, you need to know the orthogonal angle theta and the azimuthal, the base angle, phi. So this is what the del squared, the Laplacian looks like for spherical coordinates. So you can see that this is the R term, this is the theta term, and this is the theta and the phi term. <clears throat> Well, I'm going to assume that there's no angular preference. And uh, when we come to transport, I'm going to show you how to model angular preferences and how to look at, uh, we'll do spherical harmonics, we'll do discrete ordinates, uh, we'll, in, we'll include the angular flux. But right now, I'm going to say that there is azimuthal and orthogonal symmetry. So I'm just going to get rid of these two terms. So I'm just going to keep this term. So for me, the del square phi just means this. Okay, this is nothing, sorry, this is, should not be. So the del square phi is one over r d2 by dr square of r phi. Now, if you open this up, one over r d2 dr square r phi, then you can say it looks like this. And the del square phi term is like this. To simplify, to be able to solve this, you have to do a change of variables. So let me take W is equal to R phi. And you notice that if I differentiate it once, I get D W D R, which I've written as W prime, is R phi prime plus phi R prime of R, which is one. So it gives you R phi prime plus phi. If I do that again, then I get W double prime is r phi double prime plus two phi prime. And see these two begin to resemble each other. And so I've got a very nice relationship. Uh, w uh, d2 w dr square is r times d2 phi dr square plus two over r d phi by dr. So this thing I'm just going to write as uh, d2 w dr square and I'm going to take this R on that side. Okay, so, so let's look at the first equation. Now the first equation I told you is, has, is simple to solve because it's got no phi two term in there. So it's D one del square minus sigma one phi one is equal to zero. And as I said, let's divide by D one so, and this is what you saw in the previous lecture, the neutron age, Fermi age tau. So because this is for fast neutrons slowing down to a, to a cutoff point, so I'm going to use tau over here. So this becomes del square phi one. Now D one and sigma one are not functions of position. It's a uniform, uh, it's, it's a uniform system. So I just get a simple second order ODE homogeneous, there's nothing over here. And so I can write down this in W with W variable, the equation becomes uh, W double prime minus one over tau W is equal to zero. Now this I'm going to solve it by scalarizing the operator. So the operator is the second derivative. I'm going to call it a scalar M squared. There's a theory that says that if you get the roots of this scalar, then the solution is the sum of AIs multiplied by e to the mi x. 
So you can have two, three, four, as many roots as you want, as you have. <clears throat> so m square over here, if I say m square minus one over tau is zero. So m square has roots of, uh, this should be plus and minus, plus and minus one over square root of tau. So wr becomes a1 e to the r over square root of tau plus a2 e to the minus r over square root of tau. Now in the last lecture, I told you the units of tau, the neutron age are centimeter square, so this looks okay. Centimeter divided by centimeter. Now, uh, go back to phi because w was phi r, so I need to divide this whole thing by r to get my, to recover phi one. So phi one comes like that. Now, in many books, you're going to see it written as cosine hyperbolic and sine hyperbolic. So I thought this is the right time early in the course to, uh, to refresh our memories once again, that the cosine hyperbolic of a, of a variable of a number x is e to the x plus e to the minus x over two. The sine hyperbolic is e to the x minus e to the minus x over two. So, so you can get uh, e to the x in terms of these two and e to the minus. So I, now I'm going to write this and this in terms of cosine hyperbolic and sine hyperbolic. <coughs> now notice so far that I've got a1 and a2 constants, coefficients. Okay, so when I write the e to the x like this and e to the minus x like this, so what you notice is if I put the cosine hyperbolic terms together, so I get a1 plus a2 times cosine hyperbolic. And here I get a1 minus a2 with the sine hyperbolic. So let me define new coefficients because till now I have not said anything about the coefficients. So this is a, it's a compact form and these are exact solutions. So let's keep things as simple as possible. So let's say that we have B1 cosine hyperbolic R over square root of tau over R plus B2 sine hyperbolic R over square root of tau divided by R. Now, before I find out the coefficients, let's go to group two. Now, the group two equations, you can see d2r del square phi two minus sigma two phi two is minus sigma one r phi one r. This is different from the previous one because it's got a right hand side over here. So what we're going to do is that in the first, we're going to put the right hand side equal to zero. You studied that in calculus uh, in, in differential equations. And so the solution phi 2r is going to be a sum of the complementary plus the particular part of the solution. Now, many books do not take you through this detail. And so this is what I do want to take you through this detail uh, a little elaborately. So let's look first at the complementary solution. Complementary, I put the right hand side to zero. Again, I convert the operator into a scalar. And first I had b1 and b2 now. I get for the complementary solution, B3 cosine hyperbolic over R plus B4 sine hyperbolic. So there's nothing new over there. But now let's come to the right-hand side. <coughs> let's come to the particular solution. Now, particular solution over here, you can see that I write the whole equation. I should have written phi 2p, but I've done that over here. So phi 2p is this thing on the right-hand side. So I, write this as the operator d hat square minus one over l square and i take it to the right hand side so i bring it down in the denominator okay now this is what i was taught and uh, this is what you do for higher order terms that you convert them into a first order term because we're going to use the binomial expansion and we're going to treat the derivative like a scalar and we're going to use just a binomial, we're going to use a binomial expansion as if we were talking of a number. So the d2, the, the, the d hat square minus one over l square in partial fractions becomes this. And uh, so see what this becomes in the brackets. There's a d plus one over l minus d plus one over, over l. So the d's cancel out, but you get, uh, you get a two over l. So you multiply it by L over two. So the whole thing matches exactly this. And all this is going to operate on this. So I've got the minus sign in here. So this is the source term, remember, from the higher group, group one. 
<coughs> okay, let's make things simpler. Because remember, we studied that if you write down a series for 1 plus x to the minus 1, and if this number is less than 1, it has to converge. Remember, if it doesn't converge, then all what I'm saying to you does not apply. So this does not apply in all circumstances. It applies only when L d hat is going to be less than 1. Now, when I was a student, undergraduate student, when I learned this from Professor Plumpton, now, <coughs> uh, there, there were six uh, volumes of a course on engineering mathematics by Chergwin and Plumpton. I don't know if those books are still around, but I learned all my mathematics from there as an undergraduate. And Professor Plumpton taught us this, and I remember that day when I was sitting uh, in Queen Mary College in the auditorium. We were about 100 students, I think, from uh, all across engineering, uh, maybe more. And we were sitting, and, and he was explaining this to us. And I was wondering that this is an operator. So how am I going to treat it as a number? And it was just then as if he had heard my question. And he said, let's take it up, and let's expand it as if it were a number. And uh, <laughs> he said that, I told you that you can look at it as a scalar, provided, provided it converges. If it doesn't converge, then no, you cannot do this. So I got my answer there. And to this day, I remember this so clearly. And I have tried to apply this where it does not converge. And guess what? Nothing sensible comes out if it does not converge. So this has to converge for it to be valid, for, for me to be telling you the right things. So let's see if it does converge. I'm just going to show you a little test in the end, uh, which I satisfy myself to tell myself that yes, it does converge. OK, so there's a minus 1 over L, because I, I converted both of these into 1 plus or minus something. So I did some little bit of juggling over there, took the L. So L over 2 becomes minus L squared over 2. I noticed from denominator, I brought both of these to the numerator. I didn't touch this thing outside. Now I expand because this is 1 minus x to the minus 1, which is 1 plus LD plus minus 1 minus 2 divided by 2 factorial times LD squared, which is like this. The minus 1 minus 2 in the numerator and the 2 factorial cancel out. The next term will have a minus 1 minus 2 minus 3 and a 3 factorial. So they'll be, you know, they'll just go on like that. So this plus the next term over here. Now, when you write these two terms and they cancel out, then that's a good sign and uh, you're, it's something to be happy about. And if the D cancels out, then I'm pretty happy that the D cube is going to cancel out or the D5 is going to cancel out or the D7. So essentially what it says is that I've, I'm just getting rid of the odd powers of the operator. And if the even power remain, then remember one thing, that cosine hyperbolic, sine hyperbolic, exponentials are eigenfunctions, which means that if you apply an operator on that function, you get the same function multiplied by a scalar. So it's going to be as easy as that. Okay, so notice that what's left up there and what's left down there are exactly the same. So there's a factor of two and those two can twos cancel out. So minus L squared, uh, one plus, this and and this is what it becomes okay so the big question now that is this term smaller than this term and is this term smaller than one and if so then we're in business okay so so i don't know that till now okay, so so let's carry on so now what i'm going to do is because i don't know how to handle these so and Fortunately, in the beginning, I told you that they're constants. So I'm going to say that there's no function of R. So I'm just going to say it's sigma 1 over d2. Now, if I say that, I'm going to remove this from here and take it outside. So now let's see that eigenfunction bit that I was telling you. So let's look at this term, L squared d hat squared. Let's operate. Now, remember, this is not the spherical d hat. This is because... It is the d hat when we transform the equation. So this is just a d by dr. Another point that, that students often get confused on. So, so there is some point in going through this detail. 
So let's try to work out L squared D hat squared. So L squared stays there, D2 dr squared, now operating on phi one. Remember what was phi one? <coughs> Go back up and you'll see phi one was cosine hyperbolic and sine hyperbolic. So if you twice differentiate it, you get the same thing. The first differentiation gives you a one over square root of tau. The second gives you another one over square root of tau. So you're left with one over tau when you differentiate it twice. So wonderfully, you get L square over tau. Now, are the units the same? L square is centimeter square, tau is centimeter square. So it's perfectly all right. And so you see the eigenfunction bit. So it looks like we're doing very good, very well. So the particular solution is the whole infinite series minus L squared operating on this. And you don't need to get scared. Because that whole series converges. And when it converges, then I can write that whole infinite series, I recognize it to be a one minus X to the power minus one. That's the beauty of this whole thing. So you see, I have phi, so the phi got out because I transferred this from my phone. I, I, I did all this on a white paper, took pictures from my phone and, uh, and you know, WhatsApped it to my laptop. From my laptop, I put it in the word file. So the quality of uh, is not very good. As I said, I'm not a Picasso, so it doesn't matter. I'm trying to teach you the engineering and the mathematics. So this is phi, uh, what was it? phi uh, two particular is L square of a compact expression. Now recognize things as they simplify. That's the beauty of the whole thing. Uh, so phi two P of R is L square, sigma one over D two. Now this is group one, this is group two. There's not, no connection between the two. So I'll leave it like that. Well, L, L squared is D2 over sigma 2, so I can simplify the numerator, which I've done over here. I'll, I won't touch the denominator. I'll leave it like that. It looks good. So let's say my phi 2p as a function of r is this nice compact expression, phi 1r. When things come out nice, then you know you're going in the right direction. So now let's put my uh, complementary and particular together and see what a lovely solution we get. We get for the thermal flux phi 2r, uh, the complementary part plus the particular part, which is exactly the phi 1. So I had a b1 and a b2, and now I've got a b3 and a b4. So I have four unknowns. Now for four unknowns, I'm going to be needing four boundary conditions. So this is the problem that we're trying to solve. Look at it carefully. It's a sphere. And at the center of the sphere is a point isotropic source. At r equal to zero is a point isotropic source. And this is the physical boundary. The blue boundary is the physical boundary. The red point is if I add to the physical r, if I add the small d, the extrapolation distance, then I get the extrapolated boundary where the flux should fall down to zero. So, for the fast flux phi one, I let me say that if I draw a very tiny circle over here, this red circle, and so tiny that it goes to a radius of zero, there's there's nothing, there's no medium because you know this can be a medium. This can be graphite, water, anything <clears throat> other than uranium or plutonium because I'm I'm considering a non-multiplying medium. So four pi r squared is a surface area of the sphere and whatever is crossing the number of neutrons per centimeter square per crossing if i multiply i get the source term if i come closer and closer i make it the pure source term so that's one boundary condition this is called the source boundary condition <coughs> for a point isotropic source the second boundary condition for the fast source as i just told you that when it comes out of here if there's some leakage then the leakage means that this is going to have a negative slope to phi one. Negative slope means that it's going to come down to zero somewhere. And that point is R plus D one. So this is called the uh, extrapolated boundary condition. The, the boundary condition of the extrapolated radius. 
So I've got two boundary conditions for the fast flux phi 1 because J1 is minus D1 D phi 1 by DR. And I've got two boundary conditions for phi 2. Now notice that I do not have a slow or a thermal flux. I do not have a thermal flux. So I'm going to say that J2 is 0. Now the other thing I could have said over here was that phi 2 is 0. So and but so it's clear that there's nothing coming over here. Uh, but there is on the right hand side the, the thermal flux will also vanish to zero. So I've got four boundary conditions and I now need to apply my four boundary conditions and get the solution. So let's apply for the fast flux phi 1. So let's get d phi 1 by dr. d phi 1 by dr is u over v. So uh, v du by dr minus u dv by dr divided by v squared. Again, v du by dr minus u dv by dr divided by v squared. Now careful over here, there's an r squared in the denominator. So let's apply the boundary condition that 4 pi r squared. I hate it when there's an r squared and we're talking of going to the center of the sphere. Uh, but, but fortunately, the boundary condition gets rid of it. So because we say 4 pi r squared times d phi 1 by dr at r equal to 0 or going to 0 in the limit. So is b1. Now, I get rid of these r squares at the denominator, but in the numerator, I've got an r over here, no r over here, an r over here, and no r over here. So, so first of all, I get rid of these two by this multiplication, and that leaves me with a 4 pi. The second thing is, if I put r equal to 0 over here, then this goes away, and this goes away. So all I get is this term. So when I put r equal to 0, the cosine hyperbolic of 0 is 1, and there's already a minus sign over here. So I write minus 1 for this term. This term goes away, it becomes 0. So the first thing is OK. I hope you agree that this is OK. This gives this. And the plus sign is this one. Uh, this went away because the r stayed on the denominator. So it went away when I put r equal to 0. This term, the sign hyperbolic of 0 is 0. So I don't get anything from here. So <clears throat> whatever was multiplying, uh, with B2 has now gone. So I'm just left with the B1 term. So the B1 term I'm going to say is equal to the boundary condition was this one. So I've got B1. So B1 is a number divided by numbers. So it's a number. Now let's apply the right boundary condition again to the first proof flux. The right boundary condition is the extrapolated boundary. So uh, this is the extrapolated boundary. Again, the same thing, but this is, a, this is a Dirichlet boundary where we know the value of the flux and we know that it's zero, it's a vanishing flux. So the vanishing flux says that B1, B2 times the solution over here at R plus big R plus D1. Now D1, I'll tell you, uh, in the next lecture because we're running out of time we've got one more minute so i'll tell you how we get this <clears throat> but <clears throat> it's a number it's uh, 0.71 times the mean uh, times the transport mean free path lambda tr and i'm going to show you how we get that so uh, so we get from here we get a relationship between b2 and d1 so that's one equation for B1 and B2, and that's one equation for B1 and B2. There's no B2 here, so we found the B1. We're now going to put the B1 in here and find the B2. So when you do that, then this is what uh, B2 comes out to be. So you can combine them and see what a solution you get. Still looks a bit messy. So cosine hyperbolic over R minus cosine hyperbolic. And there's an R sitting over here, here, here. So there's four places there are R's. So I still don't like it, so I would like to simplify it. <coughs> so let me see what I can do. 
So let me put this down in the denominator. And so when I do this, I get a cosine hyperbolic times a sine hyperbolic. Here already I had a cosine hyperbolic and a sine hyperbolic. So that is so good because, because of these two identities. That cosine hyperbolic of A plus B has this thing with the plus sign and cosine hyperbolic of A minus B has is cosine hyperbolic A, cosine hyperbolic B minus sine hyperbolic A sine. So these handbooks of mathematics, handbooks of integral series products like Abramowitz and Stegen, Gradstein, uh, these things are, they've got to be near you. But, but that's when I was a student. You, you have the internet. So for you, it's uh, much simpler. And uh, I didn't have this luxury as a student. So I had to keep my books. I had to look at the books. I had to go to the library and sit there for hours and hours and write things down on the paper. I didn't have a cell phone or anything. So, so these two are important. And remember, now you've got symbolic computing. You've got a symbolic integral calculator as well. So you can do that all online. So use all the things available to you and use this and recognize what you had in the numerator on the previous page. So you simplify it to this expression. And this expression lets you write it as a sine hyperbolic term. And here's your answer. That phi one r is b one sine hyperbolic. There's a small r sitting there, the variable radius. There's a small r sitting over here. Now this is okay. So let me put the b ones so that I uh, get comfortable with the solution. Okay. Now what does it look like? Now recognize that a sine hyperbolic looks like that. It's an odd function and a cosine hyperbolic is an even function, it looks like that. So this, when r is zero, this is going to be a big number, but it's going to cancel out by this number. But there's a r in the denominator, so this, that's the bad thing about it. But the good thing is that there's a source at the center, so I don't want to find the plus at the center. So I want to avoid that because it diverges at the source. And uh, rest of the domain, no problems, because when this becomes big, then R1, R minus R becomes small. And when sine hyperbolic of, of a small number goes to zero, so it will go to zero and the flux will automatically go to zero. So this looks good. Uh, so just remember this, because in the next lecture, I'll begin to find phi two, and then we'll compare both of these. And then we'll also look at them that what do they mean physically, not just mathematically. So this is where I'll end this lecture. Uh, what we've done so far, I'll just summarize that I'll go back. What we did in this lecture was that we considered a point isotropic source at the center of a sphere, this sphere. And we have started with a two group formulation for a non-multiplying problem, non-multiplying meaning no uranium, no plutonium. So this is for a non-multiplying medium. And the idea here was that we should develop an understanding. Again, we assumed as a mutual symmetry. The idea over here that was that we develop an understanding in how to solve coupled ODEs. And in today's lecture, we looked at just equation 326. In tomorrow's lecture, I'm going to do equation 327, and then we're going to discuss them physically, and we're going to see uh, what the fluxes are. Because our objective here is to find phi 1 and phi 2 for a uniform medium. So I've repeated myself many times in this lecture because these are the foundations, and I have seen students later on uh, in a problem because uh, they really don't know how to solve it. I've seen many, many students who don't know how to solve these equations. So it's better when you're young to, to know this, to know it very well, to do a lot of practice. So I'm going to stop recording now and uh, we'll continue in lecture nine with equation 327.